Welcome to the April edition of Northeast Journal. I'm your host, Joe Cullen. Coming up in the next half hour, we'll welcome home two Olympian sisters from Vadnais Heights. We'll meet the new executive director of the Autism Society of Minnesota, and we'll visit the new home for a food shelf in Oakdale. All that and more is straight ahead on Northeast Journal. Hello everyone and welcome to the April edition of Northeast Journal. I'm your host Joe Cullen. Every month on Northeast Journal we give you an inside look at the people and places that make up the Northeast section of the Twin Cities. Two sisters from Vadnais Heights competed in the recent Winter Olympic Games. Hannah Brandt won gold as part of the U.S. women's hockey team and her sister Marissa competed for the unified Korean team. The city of Vadnais Heights held a big event to welcome the Brandt sisters back home and we were there. Check it out. able to uh, host the party for these great young women and uh, everything that they've accomplished uh, uh, not only abroad at the Olympics but here locally and you know they really are great ambassadors for our community and we're happy to have a little you know fun short celebration to recognize them and show them we really appreciate all they do. Winning a gold medal it was a dream come true I mean to be able we worked so hard for it as a team um, and just to kind of finally have that that happened. It's just incredible and it's it's been amazing to be able to share it with people all over the country. I feel like I've run out of words, you know, like incredible, overwhelming, unbelievable. It's like all of that and more. We hope to inspire young girls to want to play hockey. It's taught us so much and we just hope it makes an impact with them as well. So it's great seeing all the kids come out and yeah, hopefully, you know, inspire them to play and love the game. Tell them you can do anything you set your mind to, and we're just trying to keep that going and just keep inspiring young girls. Next month, Hannah Brandt will be joining us here in the studio where we'll learn even more about her gold medal winning experience. Let's switch gears now and go to Century College where a special speaker drew in a huge crowd. Now, the speaker was a bit robotic, but as you'll see, that's why people were there. Here's the story. It's not every day that a world-class speaker comes to Century College, and it's likely even rarer that the speaker isn't human. Century College teamed up with the White Bear Area Chamber of Commerce to bring in Sophia, the world's first citizen robot. Today we uh, uh, worked, networked with uh, White Bear Lake Chamber and Hanson Robotics and Century College to bring the Sophia robot to, to this uh, community. So for students and, and the community people to, to kind of get a glimpse of the future and to see what's coming down the pike, uh, especially in the area of robotics and artificial intelligence. Uh, so pretty exciting day. The crowd was full of students and also business leaders from the area. Many in attendance were familiar with Sophia thanks to numerous media appearances, including a recent visit on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. 
Sophia has lifelike features and a human sounding voice. White Bear Area Chamber of Commerce Executive Director Tom Snell tells us how bringing in Sophia is important for the community. We need to be able to uh, point to our community as being a real center of innovation and uh, really a groundbreaking opportunity for people to be attracted to move in here. People that are in what is often considered or called the creative class. And so we need to create that kind of an image in our community to market our program to those types of people. And events like that help that make that happen. Scott Simonson is the director of the Century College Fab Lab, which is a digital fabrication laboratory. He says the event was a great opportunity for his students. One of the most important things for students is to realize the opportunities in the STEM field and to realize where the future is going to be evolving uh, for, for both from a workforce and from an educational perspective and the students to realize some of the opportunities uh, linked to engineering and technology but also for liberal arts students to kind of see what, what uh, the, the workforce is going to look like and what some of the technologies that are going to be present that they're going to be interfacing with in a variety of ways. So it's really an educational day. Sophia spoke to the crowd about how she and other prototypes will transform the healthcare industry. After the event, people lined up for the chance for a photo with Sophia. You can learn more about her at sophiabot.com. An important resource for families in the Oakdale area has a new home. The Christian Cupboard Emergency Food Shelf recently moved to a new building near Guardian Angels Catholic Church in Oakdale after previously being in Woodbury. We paid a visit to their new space to see how it looks. We provide assistance to a variety of families in need in our community. So people um, that come here and visit, they visit once a month. They have the option of selecting from a variety of products that we provide, not only shelf-stable uh, products, um, which is more typical of a food shelf, but also a tremendous amount of produce and dairy and proteins are also available to our families. The need for service and support in the community continues to grow. It's a function of growing populations. And the harsh reality is we were in a fixed spot, that there was no more room to expand, uh, expand storage, expand refrigerator and freezer space, any of those kinds of things. So uh, the board and our community made some decisions about what was the best way to move ahead. And that was to find a new facility. Um, and we ended up uh, doing that here on the grounds of Guardian Angels Catholic Church. Guardian Angels is a longtime supporter of the Christian Cupboard, without a doubt. And there was a recognition that there was an opportunity with land here um, on, the, on the grounds of Guardian Angels that they potentially really couldn't use and might be the right fit for us to be able to put a, a new building on, on that property. Last year we served over 7,600 households and close to 320 tons worth of food uh, in a facility that wasn't as large as this one. Um, so we, we anticipate serving as much or more now with a, a larger facility. Go to our website, ccefs.org. Um, it has all kinds of information about how uh, what we do, how you can help us, whether financial donations or food donations or donate your used automobile that you no longer need need, um, as well as volunteering. We have a variety of roles that we look for. We have opportunities for individuals. We also have in, uh, volunteer opportunities for groups if they're interested as well. The reaction has been uh, huge. The support from the community has been great, um, and it's been really sort of a, a spectacular change for everybody involved. It's time for a short break. When we come back, we'll meet the new Executive Director of the Autism Society of Minnesota. It's the most natural thing for me to dance, but I was tripping and I was falling and didn't even know what multiple sclerosis was. When I perform, I really love connecting with people. It's definitely cool to be able to give someone an experience through virtual reality. Oh my God. I dream sometimes and I see that. Welcome back to Northeast Journal. April is National Autism Awareness Month. The Autism Society of Minnesota exists to enhance the lives of individuals with autism spectrum disorder through support, collaboration, and advocacy. Today I'm joined by the Executive Director of the Autism Society of Minnesota, Ellie Wilson. Ellie, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, hi Joe, thanks. 
And we're so glad to have you here. I know uh, you're new to us, at least. You're still fairly new in the position. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, for the past few years, we've had Jonah Weinberg on here. That's right. Um, and he left to pursue other opportunities. So now you're the executive director. How, how long have you been in this position? I started in October of 2017. So I'm almost again six months. Great. And how are you? Uh, feeling about it so far? So far so good. In fact, I worked for the Autism Society previously. I used to be their head of education and training. And so I went away for a year or a little more to work in another place to work for the University of Minnesota. And when the call came that Jonah had left his position and they were looking for somebody, I got pretty excited about that. Kind of felt like coming home. I'm very happy there. So it seems like it's a good fit so far? Great fit. And I explained a little bit in the intro kind of what the Autism Society is all about. And like I said, we've talked about your organization a number of times over the years, but since it's been a while, can you just tell us a little bit about what you guys do? Sure. Um, the Autism Society has been around since 1971, which is when I was negative 14 years old. Um, it started as a parent organization, parents who were looking to support their kids who at the time uh, didn't have a whole lot of resources or acceptance in their communities. Since then, we've grown tremendously, and now really what we do is we try to provide access to various resources across the state. So we're a statewide organization, we're a nonprofit organization, and we host all kinds of trainings and programs ourselves, but we also try to be the place anybody can call to get connected to resources in their own Minnesota community, wherever that is. Great. And, you know, again, this is something I've talked about a lot in my program, but I know people still, you know, sometimes get confused when they hear the term autism. <laughs> and since we mentioned the spectrum, so I mean, it, it can be confusing. There's so many different uh, variations along the spectrum. But just generally, how would you define autism? Yeah, so an important thing to know is autism is a developmental disability, which means it's something you're born with. It's not something that happens when you're five or ten years old or later. Um, and really, the important thing to know is that autism sort of affects how your brain grows from the time you're very young. And all of our brains tend to grow a little bit differently anyways. And autism just adds in a little bit more variation in how we grow and develop. And so what that turns out to be is that by the time kids are entering school or in school or approaching adulthood, we see differences in how they think, in how they process information, and most often how they socialize with other people. That tends to be the key characteristic that differentiates it from other types of disabilities. And like I said, there's that wide spectrum, uh, everything from severe to maybe higher functioning yeah. and maybe some kind of unique challenges along the way. But, uh, you know, many, if not most of these kids are usually very smart. That's right. But maybe just have difficulty um, interacting with people or maybe don't speak. but. There's certainly a lot going on inside. That's right. There's actually a word for that. And if we're going to get technical and fancy here, it's called splintered skills. In a typically developing brain, there are a whole lot of your skills that sort of develop together because that development is kind of interdependent. What we see in people with autism is that they tend to develop really great strengths that are sometimes better than that than peers without disabilities. But then sometimes they have challenges that seem to be more so than those with other types of disabilities. There's almost no pattern in how those skills develop, and that's why we get so much variation in the spectrum. Now, I know just a few weeks ago you held your annual walk that you do every we year, did. the Steps of Hope walk. Can you tell me how that went this year? Sure. We, were, we had an excellent year this year. Um, Steps of Hope is a free activity that we host for families every year. We use it as a fundraiser for the Autism Society to try to develop our own services and our own programs that we can offer to Minnesota families. But its number one objective is to kind of create an accepting space where people from around the state can come with their family members and their friends and they can meet other people on the spectrum and they can meet local service providers and businesses that want to include and celebrate people on the spectrum. So we had about 60, I think, um, what we would call vendors, so businesses of any type. And we prob we have a hard time counting because we don't count exactly, but we think there were about 1,000 people there this year. So a really successful year, a lot of great media attention. It always feels good to find new ways to celebrate this community with new audiences. So it was great. Great. And as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, National Autism Awareness Month mm -hmm. here in April. Uh, what are some, I know you have a uh, 
your annual conference takes yep. place in April. That's Can you right. tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Um, the uh, conference is actually like the grand finale of Autism Awareness Month for us because it's hosted at the end of April each year. This year it's from Wednesday, April 25th until Saturday, April 28th. And what we do is we host all kinds of different speakers because we know that we have broad audiences that come to our conference. Some people are self-advocates, meaning they're adults on the spectrum who want to come and network with other people um, or learn some new strategies. Sometimes we have parents or caregivers that want to come and learn about autism. And historically, we have a large population of educators and professionals that want to come and talk about various strategies. So with such a diverse audience, we try really hard to provide really great high quality content, but that has a lot of diversity in what you might be there to learn about. So um, we're really proud of the content that we have put together for this year. We have hundreds of applications of people who want to speak, and um, we always try our hard to be fair and select the best um, and make sure we're covering a lot of bases. And we're really, really excited about this year's lineup. I've seen you know a lot of the information about the lineup of some of the speakers, and I know one of the things that I'm sure for many in attendance, especially those with younger children, will be the uh, is it Julia the um, yeah the Muppet the yeah fairly new Sesame Street <laughs> character uh, right. who has autism. Uh, I imagine that'll be really exciting for kids and probably adults too. Yeah, <laughs> to typically see. conference is more for you know adults who are coming to learn, but we decided to use our venue and our sort of great setup to include a new event that's gonna be family friendly. So on that Wednesday night, April 25th, before True Conference actually begins, we're doing a really cool family event. And Julia the Muppet will be there, um, as well as a whole bunch of community providers who are gonna do kind of like a carnival style of different activities. So really kid friendly, really family friendly, and in a space that we've known for a really long time and do a great job accommodating us. That's the Double Tree um, in St. Louis Park. Great. And I know if um, people are interested in learning anything about the Autism Society, but especially the conference, your website, awesome, A-U-S-M yep. dot org, <laughs> has tons of great info. Um, you know, what are some other things that people need to be aware of, you know, especially here in uh, April? Yeah, here in April. Well, we're actually starting a little bit early. We couldn't wait till April. So March 29th, which is actually tomorrow, Thursday. Um, we're going to be hosting a film screening, which we've never done before. The Minneapolis Institute of Art has agreed to host a free film screening with us about a young man who's a self-advocate and a writer, and his name is DJ. DJ produced a film about himself. He's a completely non-speaking um, adult with autism. He uses um, assistive technology, which means he uses a machine to help convey his messaging, and his film is incredible. And we're screening it tomorrow for free at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. That's kind of our big kickoff event. Um, we also have an upcoming event at the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport where we let families come who might be planning on traveling or want to consider traveling for the first time. I understand that your family has participated in that program, Joe. So the idea is you can sign up with us ahead of time and again for free. You can come and check out what it's like to go through security. You can practice getting on an airplane and walking around the airport. Um, which is a great opportunity for families. And then for those who are feeling especially politically active these days, um, we also are hosting an upcoming day at Capitol Hill because a really important part of supporting this community is making sure that we're promoting legislation that creates those kinds of inclusive communities that we really wanna see. And so on April 17th, which is a Tuesday, our group is going to be at the Capitol, and we're going to be talking about how various pieces of legislation this year in 2018 could impact people with autism. So that's not everything, but I think those are the highlights that we'd love to see people part of. Yeah, there's always a lot going on. I know you guys usually have you know, a regular slate of classes and workshops and uh, outings, everything for you know families and teens and we try uh, to do it all. <laughs> adults with autism, everybody, you know, falls into these different categories along the way. And as you mentioned, you know, my family, I have a 12-year-old son with autism, so we've taken advantage of a lot of events, including the uh, one at the airport. But I know you guys, too, always are out at, um, you know, sensory-friendly plays yeah. and movies and things like that that have been great, I know, for our family and many other families in the area. And yeah, Actually, could you maybe explain a little bit about that? I, I know I have friends even, I'll mention, oh, yeah, we went to a sensory-friendly play movie, and I take for granted like, that everyone that? knows. 
knows <laughs> what that means, but you're hearing that more and more now. And I know I've seen, especially at the Children's Theater, mm -hmm. uh, some of the productions they do there, you'll have like a sensory friendly night. What does that mean when you have these sensory yeah, friendly Yeah, that's events? a great question. And sensory friendly can mean a couple of different things. It's actually really common that a lot of our community partners are starting to turn to us and say, okay, Autism Society, we're starting to get really hooked on this idea of including families on the spectrum. How can we do that best? And one of many ways that we can do that is what's called sensory friendly events. So what we coach various organizations to do is how can we be prepared with the types of accommodations that you might expect for someone on the spectrum. Um, sometimes, like at the Children's Theater that you mentioned, or at Stages Theater and a couple of others, what they'll do is they'll take a typical program that they always do, like a production of a play, and they'll sort of change the rules for one night. So there might be a few things that are different about the show. In general, what they're really trying to create is a really safe, really accepting space where if, you know, the typical way of doing it doesn't totally work for you or your family yet, you get a chance to come and try and have some success without anybody being judgmental or without misunderstanding what's going on. And we're seeing them all around the Twin Cities now. Um, Como Zoo in St. Paul has started hosting sensory friendly events. Um, we even got to work with the Minnesota Vikings recently, which it's really hard to make a Vikings game sensory friendly. So again, sometimes it's just about being prepared with the types of accommodations that you might expect people could ask for and just sort of opening the conversation about wanting to be inclusive and accommodating. I think one of the biggest things, you know, a lot of these events too is even just knowing there's a room available. Like, right. you know, okay, if we need to just escape for a few minutes, if he's, you know, our, your child's getting a little overstimulated. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you know, I know for us, when we take our son to these events, you know, we're still trying to model what appropriate behavior looks like at an event, but you know, if he lets out a few noises Nobody's or th things like that, <laughs> you know, yeah, like you said, you don't feel judged. You're not judging the other people. Everyone can just sit back and enjoy, you know, whatever it is, a sporting event, a play, right. a movie. And I got to tell you, Joe, I think I like them better. I've, as a person who's attended a lot of non-sensory friendly events my whole life, the, the experience of being in one of those performances where everyone in the room is really obviously enjoying and engaging in the program at their own pace, um, and in their own way, it's really fun. It makes you feel like you're connected to the people around you in a way that I never even thought of all those other times I went to performances like that, so. Well, I know even a couple years ago at, uh, I think it might've been the State Theater or Orpheum Theater downtown, they did a sensory friendly production of The Lion the King. The Lion King. And when that was first announced, even before I knew they were having sensory friendly, I remember thinking, oh, I would love to take our son to that, but there's just no way, I don't wanna be bothering other people. And then, well, they're, they're having this sensory friendly did performance. You go? And we went and it was, packed and it was just so neat to see you know all these kids and and it wasn't even just autism I mean maybe you had kids with any number of different right. uh, types of special needs or adults for that matter too um, but to know that they're in a more kind of just accepting environment or for some maybe you know lights or sound or adjusted a little bit right and you know a more that's pleasurable a, experience yeah that's a really good point I mean when you talk about what works for people with autism can work for other types of disabilities or other just differences and preferences. That's really what we're going for. In the big picture, way down the road, what we wanna look for when we think of inclusive communities are not just separate events, but ways when we're always thinking about being able to make those accommodations. And these, this sort of fad in sensory friendly programming is really, really exciting because it shows me we're taking a step in that direction. Well, unfortunately, we're already uh, out of time, but is there anything else we didn't get to that you want to quickly mention? You know, every single thing I could mention is packed into our lovely website, <laughs> which is www.awesome.org. We have so many things I couldn't begin to recount them here today, but the whole point is, whether you know what you're looking for or not, give us a call or send us an email, because in all likelihood, we have something that we can connect you with. And we're always, always willing to take questions and ideas. Um, and we just look forward to meeting new families every day. Great. Once again, it's AUSM.org. And like you, you said, a lot of great info on there. Um, encourage people to check it out. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks so much for stopping by today. And I'm sure we'll be chatting with you again in the future. I hope so. Thanks for having us. Yeah. And it's time for another short break. We'll be right back with more of Northeast Journal in just a minute. 
Some of today's veterans have a new battle to fight. It's unemployment. The unemployment rate of today's veterans coming home from war is 12%. That's twice the Heartland average. Tribute to the troops and the armed forces are asking for your help. Hire today's veteran. Visit PositivelyMinnesota.com slash veterans. Extra DWI enforcement is now being served on Minnesota roads. Don't be what you drink. Last month, we told you about the Read to Me Totes program. It's a partnership between the Washington County Library System and the Washington County Public Health and Environment. Last month, we heard about how the library got involved. Now, let's take a look at how this program is impacting the Women, Infants, Children, or WIC program. A vital program for the Washington County Public Health and Environment Department is WIC, which stands for Women, Infants, and Children. It is a nutrition and breastfeeding support program, and it's really geared for families that are struggling a little bit, um, having enough food in the house, struggling a little financially. So we provide them with nutrition education with our staff. Uh, we help them monitor the growth of their kids and give them nutrition advice for healthy pregnancies and for feeding their babies and their children. Washington County WIC coordinator Maggie Domsky tells us that she was excited when the Washington County Library asked to team up with her department to take part in the Read to Me Totes program. We take care of kids' bodies and try to make them healthy with healthy foods, but we also like to take care of the whole child and the whole family, and we know that brain development and what this program offers is such an important part of that. So now we're not only taking care of their bodies, we're taking care of their minds by encouraging reading, singing, playing from very, very early age, even prenatally. Each Read to Me tote bag includes three free books, information about early literacy education, and other items. Don LaBross, Youth Services Coordinator for Washington County Library, says the totes are even more popular than they thought they would be. We initially started out with about 200 kits that we sent out to the different WIC clinics and to the public health nurses. And within the first week and a half, they were like, we're running out. So we quickly stuffed and assembled another 300 that we've shipped out. We have um, grant funding to make enough, uh, or to make 2,500 of these kits. So we anticipate that over the year, um, this next calendar year, that we'll probably distribute all of those. And we'll just keep distributing them until we run out. The library also provided bookshelves for the WIC clinic lobbies in Stillwater, Cottage Grove, and Forest Lake for infants to be able to crawl over to look at books. There are some families that come to WIC, they have never visited a county library before. So for them to learn about all the library has to offer and, and the importance of early literacy, that is so valuable. You just see their eyes light up when we provide them with the information and tell them, you can get your baby a library card. Um, and they're getting some wonderful free books in the totes that we provide. The response has just been so positive and very, um, very exciting for our staff at WIC. The Read to Me totes were made possible through a Library Services and Technology Act grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. That's all we have time for on this month's show. Thanks for tuning in and join us again next month for another edition of Northeast Journal.